Hey guys, my name is Antonio Diaz and I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Life in Time. Thank you so much for joining us today on our latest uh, Life in Time webinar. Um, we have so much to talk about and uh, the conversation we're about to have today is one that is uh, political and highly divisive in this country. Um, so all I ask is that you keep an open mind and uh, the world of undocumented and migrant workers, for the most part, is a shadow industry here in the United States. Um, and whether we like it or not, it's, it's their labor is what puts uh, food on our shelves and uh, uh, food in our restaurants and food on our tables. Um, so there's over two million that work out in the fields picking uh, fruits and vegetables and there's another 2.3 million that work in restaurant kitchens, many of them undocumented. Um, so the purpose of this panel is to understand how we got here and ask the question, will the system ever change? Um, and joining me, we have people that are much smarter than I am. Um, we have Chef Claudette Cepeda. Uh, she's the former chef of El Jardín in San Diego and Top Chef Mexico competitor. She's also a very good friend of mine, and you know we filmed her for an episode of The Myron Kitchen. Um, and then we also have Stephanie Canizales, um, a postdoctoral scholar at UC Merced with a PhD in sociology and a focus on uh, uh, migration here in the US. Um, and then finally, we have the boys from Know Us Without You, uh, Oton Nolasco and Damian Diaz, I'm so excited for all these like really brown names. I can really flex my <laughs> my brownness right now, uh, which is exciting. Um, so Damian and and Noton, they're uh, uh, they're from Know Us Without You, who are feeding uh, undocumented workers who are unemployed here in uh, in Los Angeles. Um, so thank you guys for joining us. We're just gonna dive straight into this, okay? Um, so Claudette, I wanted to start with you. Um, you know, you grew up as a as a as a border child from San Diego and Tijuana. What was that relationship like from having one foot in Mexico and another foot here in the U.S. growing up? What did what did like the U.S. mean for your family? Growing up, so I was born in San Diego, and there's a whole generation of us that we were born in San Diego, and then my, our, the moms, you know, went back to uh, Juana, and that's where we lived, and my dad was an attorney in Mexico, and the violence level in the 90s got pretty heavy, and I remember my life in Mexico being just full of colors, and the late, the girl that lived with us in our house, so like, you know, everyone has a, a señora that we la casa that does all the housework and you know helps my mom with the four kids um was from oaxaca so there's just all these flavors and these we were my brother fractured his neck jumping off a two-story building and i was about to follow like we were like little feral children and then we got to the state move because it was just a, it became a security issue um and i remember i remember things look different i remember people look different and we moved into the projects in imperial beach and it wasn't until we got there, and I remember vividly hearing the words Beaner went back, go back to where you're from. Um, white supremacy was a really big thing in Imperial Beach during the 90s, um, the, the skinheads. Uh, it was the first time that I saw what I understood what a bomber jacket and Doc Martens meant, you know, and it was the punk scene from London got just thrown into a washing machine and it came out as white supremacist uh, uniform. And I would walk down the street and if you saw a bomber jacket and Doc Martens, you ran across the street, even though they're guys, all those guys as girlfriends were Mexican. You know, they love the brown women, but they love to hate us too. Um, and it, it, it was just like, I didn't understand why we were not liked. We were like, like we weren't, my mom, they, her nickname is La Negra you know, because she's the darkest of her siblings. But we weren't any different than other, uh, the other kids we were looking at. It was brown hair, brown eyes, like light skin. Like I didn't, it didn't dawn on me like what that hate or where that came from. You know, it wasn't until I hit the United States that I, I was hated as a person and I was called the beaner. 
I remember the first time I heard that word, I was like, oh, my mom just made beans. You want to come over? Like, they're really yeah. good. But I had no idea that it was given to me. It was skewed as like as a derogatory term. I thought, yeah, I eat beans. It's the best thing ever. Um, but it was always interesting. And then I would go back to Tijuana and my mom's brothers lived in El Florido. And if you, El Florido is this very, very, very poor part of Tijuana where you have outhouses and you have water that's outside on a concrete funneled out of a big water, you know, the water plastic um, drums. And that's how you wash dishes. My aunts would sweep the floors and the floors were dirt. And so I, I, I never was able to feel uh, better than because I always had a, I had a foot in every part of my life, like a foot in every country. And I was able to constantly reconcile like, okay, just because we're here doesn't mean we're better than because we're, you know, if we're not all doing good, no one's doing good. Um, so that was always a perspective my parents gave us and we were first generation, but my dad never let us forget that we were Mexican first. My dad actually fought my mom when she crossed the border to have me because he wanted me to be a Mexican citizen. And she was wow. like, pendejo. my other two kids that have, were born in the in States. Why isn't she going to have the same rights? And she understood right. and she had the wherewithal to run away. Literally, she ran away from her friend's house in San Diego to have me because she's like, I don't want my kids to feel any different. I don't want her to feel like she doesn't have what her brothers have because of a citizenship thing. And she's like, I don't want her to go through those struggles. So, you know, from birth, my life was always like Mexican or American and you be proud of being Mexican. We only spoke Spanish at home. We weren't allowed to speak English at home. We only spoke it at school um, with friends. And if we spoke English at, at home, it was like, oh, get the kiss. It's muy, 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 muy nice. Yeah. And then my dad would start to to us. And... So, yeah, life was interesting as a border kid. and But yeah. I didn't see it as a border, you know? And I, I speak to this often. as like, to me, it was just, we would ditch school and go have tacos in TJ. We would ditch school and go get drunk at 15. It was like a speed bump between two of my homes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Stephanie, I wanted to, uh, with that context now, I wanted to kind of uh, uh, transition over to you, Stephanie, by asking how how did we get here? Like, how did there how did our food systems and so much of other parts of American society become so reliant on immigrants, on on uh, uh, people coming from Mexico, people coming from Central America? But let's you know focus a little bit on just like the our, our our food industry and our food systems um and it has a long i mean this is a long history of not just latinos but it stems all the way back to um chinese and japanese and asian immig immigrants um it's always been kind of immigrant labor has always been a part yeah. of like our you know america's dna but um you know from your perspective like what how why did our food system become so reliant on immigrants yeah so we say immigrant labor now but a lot of the labor the land that this labor is done on in the u.s um, is native to mexico right um so we call them immigrants but they are the original land um inhabitants right and we're reliant on the labor of native populations because it's their land. They're experts in that land and cultivating the land in the seasons um, and the crops of that land. And when we construct borders that then uh, divide our land from their land, uh, we have then followed with policies that focus on market integration, economic integration. And when I cover this in my undergrad classes, on immigration uh, to the US, it really takes two weeks to really get us to the point where we understand how histories of uh, in economic integration policies have gotten us to this era of undocumented migration and to this restrictionist um, policy regime that we live under now that immigrants are subject to. Uh, but really the Mexican migrant population, we really relied on Mexican migrant labor to fill in the gaps historically, right? We have uh, the Bracero program um, from the 1940s to the 1960s where we relied on the Brazos, the arms of Mexican men, um, young men as young as 11, 
years old, um, as old as maybe 25, 26, young working age men who were uh, brought into the U.S. to work the land, right? Uh, and then when the Bracero program ended, we had this social system that sort of um, created a distinction between what is immigrant labor and what is native labor. And by that time, it wasn't only immigrant labor, but Latino immigrants, right? So US born populations to this day do not wanna do that work because of the social stigma that comes with doing immigrant work, uh, right? And then we have um, a segmented labor market where we have high end, high skilled, high paying jobs at the top tier, the primary sector of the labor market today. And then the low skill, so-called low skill, low education, low paying jobs that are the most dangerous, most precarious, least um, safe, places to work that are reliant on exploitable populations. And again, not only do US born people not want to work those jobs because of the conditions of them and the wages that are given to the workers, but because of the social stigma that's associated with working those jobs, right? Uh, so we're reliant on immigrant labor and Latino immigrant labor in the food industry, first because of economic integration policies um, that have gotten us here. And also over time, the assignment of that work to immigrants, right? Latino immigrants. And then if I can just take a few more minutes, when we get into um, the stratification of the food industry from agricultural work, um, perhaps the most um, undesirable within the food industry, the, the food pickers, right? There's a hierarchy within that as well. People who are weighing the food, that's a more prestigious job than the people who are picking the food on the floor and then somewhere in between the people who pick the food from the trees, right? So there's something about posture and presentation of immigrants in the field, sorry, in the field that is um, then traced onto like, okay, the non-Indigenous populations are the dominant, seen as um, superior, right? And we see that now uh, in terms of colorism and, and um, colonial hierarchies of who is the intelligent, capable uh, Latino and then who is not. Uh, and then the Indigenous people tend to work those, uh, those jobs that are on their knees, right? In the sun, um, picking food off mm -hmm. of the ground and um, there's these hierarchies within the occupation and also within the Latino community. And we can say the same about restaurant workers, right? The people that work in the back, no citizenship, no English, uh, perhaps uh, darker skin tones, washing dishes versus the people that are in the front, the bus boys or um, servers and so on. Um, we're going to want to dive into the uh, uh, sort of the working conditions of, of immigrants in a second, um, but I wanted to follow up with that with Stephanie with uh, why why are these migrant workers fleeing their countries in the first place? And yeah. it's very different from country to country, um, but from a you know a, a thirty thousand foot level, like why not just stay? in your home country. Right. So part of these economic integration policies that I was talking about, I'm talking about things like the North American Free Trade Agreement in the uh, 1990s signed by George Bush Sr., which really uh, intended or at face value was supposed to integrate markets, but not people, right? We want money, but not people. We want workers, but not communities and families. Um, so the NAFTA was intended to increase trade between Canada, the US and Mexico, right? And one of the um, one of the outcomes of integrating the economies of the US and Mexico was that within the agreement, the US could import crops or import agricultural products into Mexico, uh, untaxed, no tariffs, and at subsidized rates. So if the US, and then on top of that, um, the US could go into Mexico and develop uh, their own farms, right? So with technology, um, with um, the ability to buy larger parcels of land, uh, the US essentially in integrating the economies displaced Mexican workers. 
So people who lived off of agrarian land, uh, maybe were small farm owners, their land was either taken from them by the government or, or bought by U.S. corporations in order to manufacture goods. And then the, the primary reason NAFTA failed is because corn, which is the staple of Mexico, agricultural staple of Mexico, um, was subsidized from the U.S. into Mexico. So it was cheaper to buy U.S. grown corn in Mexico than to buy it from Mexican small farm owners who were producing at maybe slower rates, uh, slow, um, smaller volumes. So you had agricultural workers who were displaced from their own land, right, their own occupation by the importation of U.S. Um, owned crops. And then 10 years later, George Bush Jr. signed the Central American Free Trade Agreement. So there's a long history of um, violence-based migration, violence-incited migration from the civil wars in Central America that left decimated infrastructure, an uh, unstable economy. So when the Central American Free Trade Agreement was signed um, 10 years after NAFTA, promising that it wouldn't be like NAFTA, the outcome would be different. It was the same exact thing that happened with corn, but this time with coffee, plantains, pineapple, sugar, so those people that were already migrating because of the legacies of civil wars and the economic and political instabilities left behind by this political violence are now experiencing more infrastructural devastation because of CAFTA um, and the economic displacement that they were experiencing. And we know this is true. We know it's because of the economic instabilities in the home countries that people are migrating because of what we saw happen during the recession uh, in the U.S. Uh, in 2009, we saw a tipping point where Mexican migration, which everyone knows um, Mexican migrants had the highest numbers of undocumented migration to the U.S. for decades, right? Uh, once their economy got stronger and our economy got weaker during the recession, we actually saw a net zero trend of migration. So the equal number of people were leaving the U.S. to go back to a stronger economy as uh, we're migrating to the U.S., right? And since the 80s, we've seen a, a rise in uh, labor migration from Central America <laughs> after um, the civil wars and especially in the 2000s after the signing of CAFTA. So if we can focus on strengthening the economy in Central American nations, we can actually anticipate that migrants will return to their home countries given that the political violence, persecution, all of that also uh, declines as well. Right, right. Um, thank you for for laying that out for us. I mean, <laughs> incredible. Uh, uh, Damian and Oton, I want to kind of switch it over to you guys because uh, you guys, before Know Us Without You, you ran a, a, a hospitality consulting group called Vala here in Los Angeles. and. You guys had opened up uh, uh, some of the the hippest bars in LA, um, but give us give us like the the quick little you know two minute sort of story of what happened in mid March when restaurants had to close because of, of COVID. What was going through you guys' heads, and and how did No Us Without You come out of out of that <laughs> moment? Go for it, sure. So uh, we pride ourselves in in hospitality, uh, hence the name Bala Hospitality, Vallejo being where I'm from, uh, up in Northern California, the Bay Area, to LA, Bala. Um, we started out these hospitality programs because it was just second nature to us. We grew up in abuelitas households and our own mothers and fathers houses where the first thing that you extend to an individual that comes to your home is a water, a coffee, and so forth. Uh, we were busy and we were full force until COVID hit. All our clients, they closed down their doors and they had to repivot <laughs> accordingly. And so we were left without work. So we needed to repivot ourselves. And as a reaction, uh, we wanted to do something to help our initial community, uh, our brothers and sisters of the back of the house that were not being represented at that time, uh, months ago. Uh, we have a lot of friends and colleagues in the industry that started GoFundMes, uh, some type of charity drive and other types of things that we're allowing to help give assistance to those that are of the front of the house, the bartenders and the servers, right? But we were a little upset and uh, triggered by the fact that there was zero representation of the <laughs> hospitality industry as a whole 
and as a whole, I mean by back of the house, the line cooks, the prep cooks, the porters, uh, you know, it, it extends the dishwashers, you know, and these are the individuals that are the backbone of our hospitality mm -hmm. industry. So at that point, we started up a conversation and we started out with 10 families, respectfully so. Uh, we reached out to our immediate networks, uh, hitting up our chef friends, our bartender friends, people that uh, we hold close to our hearts, but that knew or know of any individuals that need assistance uh, because they don't qualify for any type of uh, federal stimulus. They don't qualify for unemployment or any other type of government aid. And these are the individuals that we are going to need to depend on moving forward if we expect our industry, let alone our hospitality industry, let alone our economy to get anywhere remotely close to where it needs to be. So from 10 families, uh, we grew to what well, we're at 600 families that we're helping a week now. Wow. And we're doing that um, through text message, through WhatsApp, through phone calls, in, uh, all these types of conversations. We're trying our best due diligence to give priority to their safety of their identity and as well as their immediate family that come and pick up um, at these at these pickup windows. Um, our really good friend, Daniel Zarate, he brought it up to our attention to have to keep into consideration the pickup locations and having to switch them off every week, every other day, so that we can continue protecting their identities and security. Uh, so we, I hate to say it, uh, Oton and I, we always say it's like, we kind of treat it like a drug deal, like meet us at this place at this time on this day. And we do that and facilitate that through text message. I'm, I'm working around the clock with each and every single one of these families on my phone. And we're having to like pivot this person can't pick up on this day because they have no babysitter. This other person can't pick up because they just started working two days a week now that the economy is open. So, um, and then there's there's the fact that maybe someone contracted COVID and they have to send someone on their behalf. And there's always these types of lines of communication that we have to adhere to because in an ideal world, yes, we could streamline this type of program by sending out mass texts and mass emails. But what about their identity? It, our convenience cannot be displaced because of someone's security. We have to take that in top priority, which is why we do the things that we do the way we do them. So um, primarily, we, we help and focus on the back of the house individuals that don't qualify for any government assistance. Uh, we do have inquiries where we have undocumented individuals from other types of industries, whether it's a fabric worker or a construction worker and other facets of life. It's not that we don't want to help those individuals, it's just that we don't have the current capacity or infrastructure to open the floodgates, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. Uh, we're a little over three months into our program and we're bringing in other programs like tutoring and delivery services, and in some cases, some type of job placement through word of mouth that we've been facilitating for a growing number of families because there is always a growing number of, of needs in each family. Absolutely. So. Yeah, a little bit of background on what we got going on. So your website says that uh, for thirty three dollars, you you could feed a family of four for a week. So what does that include? Like what 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 do you pick up on these pickup windows? Like what what's the type of food or or ingredient or hot food? Like tell us a little bit of like well, Tony, you want to jump how on you're feeding. Yeah, when we first started, uh, so the first day we we went and just bought food. Um, we bought staples, and a lot of those staples are still in our, our food relief kits. Um, filled up our truck, brought it back to our office, and portioned out what what we would give families. And it was actually Damien who had the idea of we didn't need to just feed individuals. It wasn't about just feeding a dishwasher. That dishwasher, she might have a husband at home and you know two little kids. So it, we would have to feed a family. And so once we figured out that we could that we could feed a family, then we started portioning out what does a family's like rations, if you will, for a week look like. So, you know, um, it was very wholesome food, nothing, nothing very exciting, to be honest. Uh, we have <laughs> rice, we have beans, we have tortillas that we get from Colonel of Truth and Bull Heights, like these beautiful mixing with rice uh, tortillas. Um, there's you know, uh, zucchini, citrus, there's broccoli. No. Eggs. There's milk, there's eggs, there is chorizo, there's jamon, um, 
there is a lot of additional things that we get donated that we're very proud to include. So we'll get, right now we have cold pressed juice, you know, it's beautiful cold pressed juice from Mexico. You know, we have a supplemental um, ready to ready to eat, just need to be warmed up, uh, casseroles and lasagnas from our good friends at Secret Lasagna. Every time they sell a lasagna entree to a customer, they donate one to our families. and. You know, they've, wow. they've graciously donated probably about $50,000 worth of, of family meals to our families. And Holy things like that are very important to us because we always say that we're, we're happy to feed those who have been feeding us for years. You know, Damien and I have been working together for seven years now. And I remember when we first, the first place we worked at was a, a small Mexican restaurant in Skid Row. And, and the ladies and gentlemen that worked in the kitchen would always take care of us. You know, we'd come in hungover we're tired or just, you know, we didn't eat. They would make sure we ate. They were like our extended tias and abuelitas. They always make sure we were fed. And for us now to be able to make sure that, you know, the families that fed us for years are fed is, is that's all we want to do. Absolutely. Um, Claudette, um, as a chef and, uh, you know, you've worked in many kitchens. I wanted to, I wanted to just kind of like, uh, I wanted you to describe a little bit of like that hierarchy in a kitchen. And, you know, in a kitchen you have every possible renegade, right? It's the, uh, 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 you know, many of them being Latino immigrants, sometimes undocumented. You have um, people with records, uh, previous records. I mean, people without papers, people with papers. The background, your background really doesn't matter as long as you could hack it in a kitchen, right? Um, yeah. Why is that? Like, why is there that special bond between the chef, the restaurant, and its people, despite where they come from, who they are, whether they're, they have papers or not? Can you describe a little bit about that bond and the relationship that? you don't really see in almost any other industry except the, the restaurant industry. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons for me. Personally, I can speak to the fact that, you know, I've been working in the industry for 18 years. I have come up, I've been called the piece of crap every single day. When I first started, I was told that I was no good. I didn't know how to cook by male superiors. And um, every time I left the job, I read, read pro and con list and always on the pro list was the environment that we like the cooks would create amongst themselves of like I got your back you got mine for family meal you're busy so I'm going to get you a plate and we're always looking out for each other and by the time I opened up my restaurant it was like my number one goal was to create a special culture amongst our staff because we knew that what we can create in a restaurant is in any restaurant you work at, you create a family that's like you, I spend more time in my kitchen than I do in my home. My kids have had their birthdays in at El Jardin. They both had two birthdays each at the space. Um, and just taking care of each other. We do it inherently. Like we as cooks, it's the most blue collar, the most like visceral job we can do is sustain life. We sustain life amongst ourselves with just our morale um, and then we feed people and when we feed people we do it because we love it like no one works as hard as our industry and goes back day after day and what's that definition of insanity quote like we go back hoping that it's better every single day and and it, it is and it isn't and at 11 o'clock at night I would you know we'd have a really awful day but I knew we needed to harvest vegetables from the garden because it, it was going sideways and it's gonna be a hot day the next day and all of us would go out, no matter if it was sprinkling or how cold it was outside, and we would harvest vegetables and the environment that we would create because I wasn't allowing anyone to drink in our restaurant. There was no shift drink. There was no, um, it was a big mental health uh, point in my uh, restaurant. And by the time they would go out to, the, to harvest the vegetables, they would come back in. And mind you, I had every walk of life as an employee. They would front of house and back of house. They would just come back with this big grin on their face of how amazing it was to see what we were growing and to see that the next day was going to get applied into the dishes. And we just take care of each other because at the end of the day, most of us come from, like, we all have scars. Like, underneath our industry is littered with, 
you know, shitty upbringings or, you know, military background that they end up like, you either can do the military or you can be a cook. And they're kind of the same thing of how you, you know, you before how you got treated in restaurants is very militant. Um, and now it's just, in my opinion, what I'm trying to, the culture I'm trying to cultivate is one of, we take care of each other because we're, we feed others, which is also taking care of others. And the commonality, no matter what walk of life you come from, no matter how rich you were or how poor you were, no one, no one's economic background matters at a table when food's placed in front of them. Everyone's on the same level, right? You have both all are eating the same thing. The, Food on the plate comes from a bunch of different places all over the world. And we have that commonality. And once that, all those barriers come down, can you hack it? Can you work? Can you show up every single day with, you know, leave your bullshit at the door and show up and support your fellow cook and not let them fall. If they fall, help them up. Um, and that's the culture that we always, you know, we push for in El Jardín. When, we were, when I opened Bracero, it was the same of like no matter how shitty of the day at the end of the day we all talked about our grievances and it was like a therapy group amongst us um i think it just happens because we all lack something in our past or we yearn for something in our current life and restaurants fulfill that absolutely and something that was like very that uh uh, uh was very unique about you claudette was there's this sort of perspective from chefs that they have to be sourcing ingredients locally, right? Right. And yeah. um, importing anything is like, oh, you know, that's that's uh, that's not local. We've gotten to this mentality like local, local, local. But yeah. you were working closely with um, producers and farmers in Mexico mm -hmm. and importing yeah. their artisanal products here um which in a way is supporting small producers in mexico and providing um economic sustainability for them there so they could stay working in mexico in their home yeah um yep. in their homeland yeah. what has that what was, what's that balance like as a chef to consider you know where your products are coming from balancing that perspective that things need to be local but at the same time you're also supporting um these farmers and these producers in a complete different Yeah, I mean, country. I think for me, one of the biggest things, and I, we spoke about it in the migrant kitchen, is being able to pay it forward, right? Like, there's a lot that we owe in the United States to Mexico. Um, because of what we've done, and I put myself in that category, I'm a Mexican-American, so I get thrown into that, I'm a gringa to them, right? I, until I speak Spanish, because I have green hair and I speak good English, they think I'm just a white girl. And then I started speaking to them in Spanish and then they're like, Oh, their demeanor changes. And I, you know, it, it's not, I didn't want to ever go to that, go to Mexico, go to my motherland, take from it and just be like, I'll see you later. You know, it was always like, how can I pay it forward at the restaurant? The, the plates were handmade from Guadalajara because that's where my family's from. I help a business literally stay afloat with the order from my restaurant. Um, I set up micro businesses throughout Puebla, throughout Oaxaca, in the Yucatan Peninsula, in Sonora. And it was always to like start micro businesses. I would find women that didn't have businesses, but they had the wherewithal to be able to harvest this and this and get me. And I didn't need a crazy amount of quantities. And I balanced it with, we live in San Diego. Like I have the best of produce all over the world. Like I think Southern California has some of the best produce year round available. Um, so I focus on what makes Mexican food special. And Mexican food is special because of the three milpas, corn, legumes, and squash. So I would get the seeds from one purveyor and I would get the beans from another purveyor in Puebla, the best ayocotes you can ever find, right next to where I buy my cotica añejado, the cotica that's aged in caves for a year. And it was that balance of dry goods were got for, what I bought from Mexico, I imported them into Tijuana and I crossed them over totally okay like I made sure at USDA I wasn't breaking any laws but Mexican food is special in Mexico because of the ingredients solely it is obviously a little bit of the mom that the that abuelita touch but I do believe that when you have a proper ingredient you really start it I'm an ingredient facilitator I don't have to 
fuck with a chile that's good. A pasilla, de, a pasilla mija, like, that chili stands on its own, and it could stand to any French dish just alone. You could literally puree that chili, and it would have so much complexity, so much flavor, not available in the States, not available in the northern part of Mexico, from right. central Mexico to the north. You don't see it. So it was a big point for me to go to these small villages, find the ingredients that made that cuisine special, and show off the originality of it in my restaurant. And then all over the menu, it said where I bought it, who the person was that inspired that dish, because it wasn't about me, it wasn't about my ego, it was about the people, it was about Mexico and the moms, the matriarchs that have no voice. You go to these pueblos and they have literally all women because the men have left to immigrate to other parts of Mexico or other countries and these women's recipes die with them. So I wanted to start these micro businesses to support them and at least as much as I could you know, I wasn't a giant restaurant that I wasn't going to be, you know, I wasn't Nestle coming in and saying, I'm going to buy all your stuff. It was working with them and learning from them. And I would buy their harvest and then I would go and sit with them and talk to them and learn their story. And so they felt seen. They didn't feel just abused about, or, you know, or taken from. Mm -hmm. It was, I see you, I want to work with you. And that was, you know, it wasn't easy, but it was, I think it was necessary because you can only talk about locality so much until it becomes, well, then what does it matter? Like farm to table, everything comes from a farm. I mean, what kind of farm, but everything like a vegetable grows on a farm, no matter where you are in the world, you know? So I think it, all those words got just so watered down. They stopped meaning what they originally were intended to mean. So mm. I am local because Mexico is local to me. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Stephanie, uh, I wanted to talk about the Central American experience which is different than uh, Mexican immigrants coming to the US and the Central Americans especially have it a little bit tougher because they have an entire other country to kind of get through um, and there's also a misconception that we kind of uh, uh, you know we just kind of bundle up all immigrants into one category and the plight and the struggle is the same for everybody um, what sort of relationship does Mexico have with Central Americans and especially as they're moving through their country to get to the US what what can you tell us as far as like what that experience and that relationship looks like from the perspective of Central Americans yeah so to arrive in the US Central Americans have to cross multiple borders right Guatemala and Mexico share a border but everyone else from Central America coming uh, from El Salvador, Honduras, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, they cross through other countries, cross through Guatemala and then through Mexico, right? Um, and there's always been a tension in this, I mean, the same way that people in the US say Mexicans are here taking their jobs, um, there's that tension in Mexico as well. Central Americans passing through for several decades sometimes have to stop in Mexico have jobs for a little while to fund their migration to continue um, their journey north, right? So there's um, a, a similar sentiment about Central Americans taking jobs. There's a, a demonization, a criminalization of Central Americans historically in Mexico. And that carries into the relationships that people have in the US as well, right? Tensions between Mexicans and Central Americans, so much so that even while I was growing up here uh, in Los Angeles, my parents would tell me, um, a US born Salvadoran, that I should tell people that I was Mexican, just so I wouldn't get picked on by Mexicans. Um, I wouldn't what? get casted as like an outlier in school, right? So you say you're Mexican. And if someone asks you where you say, I don't know, I've never been there, right? So because I actually didn't know a lot about Mexico when I was in third grade, because I wasn't Mexican. Um, but it was a protective mechanism, right? And there's research that shows that Central American immigrants actually adopt strategies of Mexicanization. So um, learning the Mexican Spanish accent, learning uh, capitals, learning, um, I don't know, little tidbits of information so that when you're crossing through Mexico, you can pass as Mexican. Um, in my research with unaccompanied minors, uh, I actually interviewed a Guatemalan, uh, or no, a Honduran man who uh, grew up in Guatemala and got Mexico tattooed on his stomach so that when he was crossing through Mexico, if he were to be deported, they would send him uh, to Mexico and not to Honduras or Guatemala. 
so strategies um, as drastic as those permanently tattooing the word Mexico on your body as a survival strategy through migration. Holy cow. Um, so there's tensions within the, the populations, right? The, the ethnic groups, the national origin groups. Um, and that really shapes how people experience the migration and then integration process in the U.S. as well. And of course, when people migrate across multiple borders, migration is more expensive. The urgency to find employment is higher because the debt is greater, right? Um, you employed multiple coyotes instead of one from Tijuana or wherever it may be, right, just across the border. Uh, and then that creates tensions in the workplace in the U.S., right? Um, I've heard, I do a lot of, of work with indigenous Guatemalans in the garment industry, and they say that the Mexicans say that they're here taking their jobs um, in, in the garment industry, jobs that pay maybe 40 to $60 a week, right? Like these aren't even very like lucrative wait, wait, positions. Wait, 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 wait. But, so, um, <laughs> so Americans say uh, the Mexicans <laughs> are taking their jobs and then the Mexicans are telling the Central Americans that, Central they're, taking Americans their that they're taking their jobs. And this is why capitalism has us so spun around that people are business owners, corporations, uh, factory owners, restaurant workers, farm owners, or restaurant owners, they're trying to get the most work for the lowest cost, right? So when you have people who have $13,000 of debt because they came from El Salvador versus 3500 4, $4,000 of debt from Mexico, the Central American is going to take whatever job you give them because they need to pay off their debt, right? So they're willing to take a job uh, in the garment industry that pays 25 cents uh, per zipper on a denim pant, that the Mexican was getting paid 35 cents for that same zipper on the same pair of pants. So then there's tensions between, well, now they're taking our jobs, right? And then you get into like indigenous, non-indigenous, and the indigenous people are exploited even more so. Um, I've met people who get paid five cents a zipper and get paid maybe seven dollars at the end of a day where they sewed hundreds and hundreds of jeans you know like denim jeans wow. um i can get into that at another time we're talking about the food industry but uh that's that's what we're talking about right and it all is to benefit capitalistic corporation owners business owners farm owners um and when you get into that this idea that latino immigrants or immigrants are taking american jobs there's no u.s born person that's gonna pay get paid 35 cents an hour, you know, it just doesn't exist. Um, Americans don't want those jobs. And people in dire conditions throughout Latin America with no um, employment prospects there, uh, we call it a social death, right? You're not physically dying, but your prospect of living a fulfilled life and having opportunities for mobility and growth, you're socially um, dead, you're dead. You're, there's no opportunities for you. So people migrating, looking for social life, social prospect, right? Um, and those are the people that'll take those jobs that pay next to nothing for the sake of survival, right? Absolutely. And I think, um, let's, let's talk a little bit into the-, the Oh, I can't hear you. Oh. Yeah. How about now? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Okay, go. I'm good. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm like, this is like CNN, control room over here there's a lot to manage <laughs> and to also moderate so uh bear with me here um stephanie why why don't they just come in legally like that's also another co a misconception and a question that many americans have like you want to come here why do you have to come in illegally so why don't you just go through the legal process like everybody else so why is that such a big deal for uh for for latin immigrants yeah um so we know that there are eight million there are about 11 million undocumented people living in the u.s today eight million of them are employed seven, accounted for employed these are people that are age 17 and older um, who have employment status in the u.s um and I was just fact checking yesterday just to make sure I have my numbers right. And there are 750,000 visas allocated across the visa system, um, not including refugees and asylum seekers, that's its own thing. And then there are uh, 
allocation specifically for the um, close kin, right? Like children, uh, parents, and brothers and sisters of US citizens and legal permanent residents, that's separate. But 750,000 visas that are allocated across skill levels, employment um, statuses, and so forth. And um, that comes nowhere near the 8 million undocumented people we know live in the US today. So when we say that um, illegality is legally constructed, it's to say that there's policies that have been put into place, including immigration and visa policies that see the demographics, see the need, right? At least 8 million people are needed in the US economy to sustain us. 53% of those people are in the food industry, everywhere from farm workers um, to the people driving the trucks that are delivering the food, to retailers, to restaurant workers, um, people working in um, manufacturing of like uh, processed foods, like it's across the spectrum, right? Over 4 million of those people work in the food industry. Um, but the visa system doesn't account for that need, right? Um, and we went from a visa system that, um, a legal immigration system that was hemispheric. We had 170,000 visas allocated to the Eastern hemisphere, 120,000 to the Western hemisphere. Uh, and then we decided that that was not diverse enough or it wasn't equal, right? Um, to give preference to one hemisphere over the other, obviously giving preference to European immigrants over Latino uh, immigrants. Uh, so we have now not only a limitation of 750,000 visas overall, 675,000 visas overall, uh, but each country has a limitation of 20,000. Um, so when we give 20,000, I was trying to think of like the best analogy last night. If we give 20,000 legal opportunities for migration to France and 20,000 legal opportunities for migration to Mexico, but how many people from France are leaving France to come to the US to work? And then how many people are coming from Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, so on and so forth seeking work in the US? When we have 3000 people seeking employment from France, um, those other 17,000 visas aren't reallocated to Latin America, right? They're just, they're lost. They don't roll over, that's it. So everyone coming from Mexico or any other Latin American country is really competing for those 20,000 positions. But we know at least 4 million Latinos are working in the US as undocumented people, right? Like the numbers don't add up. So anyone that, has to, that tries to migrate out of the 20,000 is automatically an undocumented person. So really we're, we are consciously legally constructing an undocumented population. Right, And this is a result of economic integration policies that date back decades where we're displacing and disrupting economies. And then we say, oh, hold on. If you wanna come over here, only 20,000 of you per year, but we're displacing hundreds of thousands of people and all of it is to benefit ourselves. So the visa system, um, the logic behind it doesn't match the demographics of the immigrant population. And it doesn't match the need of our economy, right? Like I said, Americans don't want these Im so-called immigrant jobs. Uh, and there are people who are willing to take them, right? But we have these limitations that then construct this um, illegal or undocumented person. Let's talk a little bit about those, those jobs that, that Americans don't want and why uh, uh, there's another misconception that I want to address, which is uh, undocumented workers, migrant workers, they're coming in and stealing, stealing our jobs, stealing our American jobs. Damian and Claudette and Oton, you guys uh, have been in the hospitality industry for a long time as employers and as leaders, and you review who is applying to kitchens, mm -hmm. um, to the back of the house. Um, are other Americans even applying to these jobs? Is it really, are they really coming in and stealing these jobs? Or what's happening here? Why isn't, why aren't we seeing more, you know, uh, uh, white, young college and high school kids doing these jobs in kitchens? Because these white college kids don't want to work 80 hours a week as a dishwasher. As real as that. 
Yeah. Because, because from janitorial to working con pico y pala allá afuera con cemento, I, oh, um, yeah. this is yeah. dramatic. Yeah. I, I would onboard, speaking from experience, I would onboard uh, at, a, at a place where we used to do uh, business at. And I, out of all the dishwashers, if we're talking dishwashers, just in that puesto, at, at that occupation alone, zero for whatever reason. And that's the God honest. It's very hard work. It's, your hands get wet. You risk breaking nails, infections, cutting yourself, uh, slipping and falling. And then there's yeah. also that hierarchy system that keeps getting brought up. It's the back of the house, the unsung hero of this Michelin star restaurant, of this James Beard award-winning bar. And yet that individual, he or she back there has no communication with not only the front of the house, but there's like servers and, and in some cases, busters and other employees that don't even know that person's name. Yeah. That's the perspective that the people need to realize. This is, you're, you're literally like just working for 80 hours a week with your heads down and that's it. And someone calls yeah. in sick, who's going to put that liquor order away? You know, and then and at the end of the night, speaking from experience and Othon, you can vouch too, is like as a bartender at 2, 30, 3 in the morning, you have that bus tub filled with trastes and dishes and God knows what else is in there. And you just dump it <laughs> on that person. And you don't even know their name, possibly. Wow. So who, who in the right mind would want to work? It's these individuals that are the backbone. These are, these are the individuals because they have no other choice because they have families, they have mouths to feed. They have a six-year-old back home, they have a 12-year-old, and they have one person that's this close to going to college. And yet they work these 80-hour weeks, and yet they have another job on top of that because they have a morning job that they have to get to in, in five hours. Yeah, I, I challenge I, I, I challenge anyone to make tortillas, like my tortilleras at El Jardín for 45, 50 hours a week, looking down for eight hours a shift, sometimes 10. I challenge any American to do that and not freak out. You know, I would have cooks that would just look at me and say, you know, I would have young, privileged American youth come into my restaurant and I would take in anyone. Please, like, come on, learn what we do, learn our food. I love that. I love teaching other people our cuisine. But with a week in, they're crying because they don't want to make tortillas. They don't want to spend hours making tamales. They don't want to do the salsa. Salsa, chef, I'm coughing. It's too spicy. And I'm just looking at them like, you can't <laughs> judge us as a fast food nation, you know, as Mexico is just this whatever cuisine by taco shops. And then you can't do what we do. And this is so ingrained in us of like the tamales during Christmas, you know, like it, it, we're taught this at a, such a young age of, don't complain, this is food, right? And that's something that's missed in American culture that it's just so easy to have Amazon drop off your groceries at your door. But in our restaurant, it's who will do, who will wash the dishes? I would have a thing where I would wash dishes every Wednesday because I, I couldn't get a dishwasher. So then I would do it every Wednesday, mm. head chef, James Beard nominated, Michelin, Big Gourmet. It didn't matter. I wanted to show everyone that if I'm willing to do it, why the hell can you say you don't want to do it, right? And it was like, that's the culture we breed. But then when I would get the staff complaining about not wanting to do it, and the six-year-old woman is there for fucking 45 hours a day, a week, making tortillas, I'm sorry, your complaints land on deaf ears because we there are people that will do it. It's just a very specific people. You know, people that see that what they're going to do is going to put their family ahead and they're going to see apart from themselves. And that's something that I even see with my own kids. You know, I have teenagers. Sometimes they are, uh, they're not able to see beyond themselves. They're not able to see the greater picture. So that's what I'm trying to teach them. And I try to teach all of my mentees of like, it's not about you. It's about what you can do for other generations, for future generations, mm -hmm. for other people within your own family. How can you help? And a lot of it is doing the grunt work that no one else wants to do. Absolutely. I want to ride on uh, Claudette's coattails and just add racial things aside. There's a disconnect with these generations, right? The generational yeah. gap that is upon us. Um, 
there's a sense of entitlement, 100%, yeah. because everything is me, 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 social media, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, uh, TikTok, all these freaking things that these kids are now young adults, 18 to 20 something year olds. And they're like, I, I, and I'm speaking by experience. I won't say where, but there was a gentleman that I had to kick his ass out. And I was like, Mira, cabrón, ponte las pinches pilas, o si no, yo voy a trabajar por ti ahorita. And that's for Ascoton. That fateful night in December, it was, it, it, there was a tassel that switched because at that point I realized he was 22 years old. Y este cabrón era raza, he's Latin, that's all I'll say. But there was an age gap where it was like, I'm better than this. Yeah. Well then, yeah. cabrón, why did you apply? Why did you waste my time and everyone else's time in this kitchen? You need to apologize to everyone in the back of the house right now before you leave. Yeah. yeah. Because there's that sense of entitlement that I can only do this for eh, four hours a day. No, there's other individuals that don't have that liberty. So why don't yeah. you just go stop wasting our time and give someone else that needs that to be facilitated in their own lives, give them a chance. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and then again, like Damian said, like it has nothing to do with race. It's generationally, I've been in Mexico city. I did one of my biggest events feeding a thousand people in three days. And Mexican students, culinary students, were like, Chef, my back's hurting after like three hours. And I'd look at them and I'd shake my head and I was like, just go home. <laughs> like, I, I ain't got time for you. This is a job that you really have to be all in. If your back hurts at three hours, I can't help you. And it was like, I tried to be as nice as I could, but it was just like perspective. This is a life, like it's a life decision to be in this industry of like, your back's going to hurt, your feet are going to hurt, and you're going to put your shoes on the next day and do it all over again. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, Oton and, and, um, and Damian, I wanted to just kind of uh, quickly ask, what's the, what what's like the living conditions for a lot of these undocumented workers here in Los Angeles? And as you have started to meet a lot of them in person, communicate with them, I mean, you guys are feeding like over 500 families at this point. Um, 600, 600. 600, Jesus Christ. So what are some of the stories you're hearing as far as their living conditions in, in Los Angeles? Oh, man. Where do I start? Uh, so let's take you through a walk over like our day to day. Right. We package everything here at the shop. Our really good friend, Edwin. And although they're in charge of logistics here, mm -hmm. they package everything. We get counts up and we have everything accurate so that when we go out in the field, everyone is accounted for. And by I mean everyone, if you, for example, have four pickup windows over the course of a Tuesday for X amount of people, we do it almost like a reservation system. So after we send out the information of the who, what, where, and why, and all that good stuff, we get a confirmation. And by confirming, you get a dispensa, a food package, apartada, which uh, which we put it aside for you and then people start coming in right and that's where in the stories start so for example my vetting process I get their information on a questionnaire we'll start there and I cross-reference the information that they are willing to give on the questionnaire I cross-reference that over the phone with what they're able to explain and basically answer based on what they were answering previously so then how do you build the rapport with an individual within a matter of minutes enough to get their pay stub information just to confirm that they are who they say they are on top of they work where they say they work. You have to rip up old wounds at times and, and make them realize that you're one of them. They are you. Yo les digo, and I'm sorry for those that don't speak any Spanish, but yo les digo a los, a los compañeros y comadres, usted me corta a mí, yo la corto a usted, vamos a sangrar igual. We bleed the same, yo. And, and they finally get some sense of, okay, what's, what's to come? And we're going to change the address every week so we can protect you and your families and your identities because we don't want any problems with ICE or federal agents of any sort, especially with the time of the protests and everything that was going on. And continuously, there's helicopters, there's National Guard. There's, it's scary for, for ourselves as citizens, let alone as someone who doesn't have any papers. You live in a constant state of paranoia just to go fill up your gas tank. 
every fucking day, you know? Yeah. And now you're telling them, may I have your information? So once you get implemented and that system works because people are like, well, isn't that a, no, that's the only way to do it because we have 600 growing families and we're not putting a stop on that. That's the only system that works because you have to deal with it on a case by case basis. So now knowing that day one comes, it's their first pickup day. It's 11 o'clock anywhere, let's say right here in Los Angeles and you have the young lady or the young man come with maybe a kid or two because they feel unsafe or they feel exposed and they see a, a weirdo with a man bun and a compa with a, a, a beard and some other folks doing all kinds of shit in the distance and they're like is this for real what's going on so then at that point one must humble ourselves to bring them into this new world this new ritual of locally sourcing whatever type of ingredients you can you can provide for your family initially puro espanol my spanish is is gotten a lot better thank god um, I like to see and your fa the families are very timid the first thing that we do is offer them water Espe especially with the unforgiving heat and the climate that mother nature has been giving us lately so it's like también. and then there's people waiting in the car down the street we run over there and give them water too. We're lucky enough and fortunate enough to to have our uh, friends from Topo Chico. They they have Topo Chico in their hands. I mean, what Topo Chico? No, no big deal, bro. You know, that's we, the that's the champagne Topo, of Topo water. Freaking Chico, dude. <laughs> what? You know? So it's like, so there's that, and already it's this hospitality that they're starting to feel mm -hmm. because we don't need to be confined to four walls like a bar or restaurant to showcase our sensibilities and our approach to hospitality. We bring hospitality on any fucking street corner, y'all. We keep it real. And that's the way we do it. So then the families know that we keep it real and then they can trust us. Mm -hmm. It goes from that into a gradual, every week you come and pick up at the same time, at not the same place. But then there's also other sub stories that you've asked. So let me go into that. So now you get into the fact that you have gentlemen and I'll say gentlemen, because it's, it's just based off experience. There's a stigma being a Latino, Latina, Latino ex, that is machismo. When you're machista and all this unnecessary bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. So between that and pride, it's a very for, for any line. For anybody, Diamond, for anybody who doesn't know what machismo is, sure. tell so us what that is. Being macho, being the head of the household and and chauvinism. being the being the chauvinism exactly oh and that's such stigma that our generation more than ever needs to help beat down and put that aside and it starts with these types of conversations so when the gentleman comes and drops off his wife or his baby's mama or his girlfriend or his mom or his grandma in some cases he stays in the car sometimes this gentleman stays in the car and I or myself or Oton or Cedric or one of our other volunteers go and help this person over to the car and the gentleman still doesn't come out. He's on Facebook on his phone or he's listening to whatever he's listening to on the radio. And at that point, that's a red flag because he doesn't feel comfortable. And in this case, a man or a head of any household being able to come out for fear of being ashamed or for that machis mach machismo uh, thing. It's just more so like having that type of conversation to facilitate an understanding for a lack of understanding, I should say, and under and have them understand me like everyone is going through some version of what you're going through. It's okay to be prideful and have your fucking dignity as a person, but you could still help us to help your family. And in week two and week three, that gentleman starts to come out and help with the groceries or help with the, the, the packages that we provide. And then you know that gentleman by a one-on-one a, a -on -one, uh, basis, by their first name. And then he's the one that you're communicating. Because of that same stigma, when I vet families and I give them a call, if I call Fulana, right, this random, random lady, and I give her a call, I have a gentleman answer the phone. <laughs> and, he's, and he's like, who the, quien chingados is, quien es? I'm like, oh, me llamo Damián Díaz, estoy llamándole de la organización No Es Without You, uh, me mandó su información aquí. And he's like, no, and he hangs up. It's like, you 
you just don't know how to accept help. Not because I'm a man, not but just help in general. So there's this current obstacle of having to really pull a tooth just to help certain individuals in certain cases. And then you'll get into the fact that like week, week three or four, I started seeing, uh, Oton and I, we all started seeing that people were starting to come late and to ghost me and just like radio silence our text message conversations. And then I quickly, we quickly realized that people were selling their cars and their modes of transportation for as little or as much as they can receive. And then they started taking the bus and other public transportation and having to expose themselves or risk exposing themselves to COVID and other things just to get a package of food coming from anywhere in LA County. I had a woman one day, she walked from Koreatown to where we yeah. had the drop off. And wow. I explained to her that the buses weren't charging and she just had no fucking clue. And we got her an Uber to back, go back home. And as a result of that, we repivoted to create a delivery system to for the most, most in need as part of our program. And thank you for all the volunteers that have donated their time to help facilitate food assistance directly to their doorstep. Because someone's grandma, la abuelita que venía de Silver Lake, now doesn't have to A, expose herself to COVID or risk it, and also make a four hour, five hour round trip journey if she's coming in from Silmar or Long Beach to take the, the, the blue line. These are the individual stories that, this is the reason, these are the reasons why we can't streamline these types of systems. Mm -hmm. This is why we, we go till midnight, till four in the morning sometimes, trying to communicate these families. And this is the reason why we have to explain them that it's okay once you get some type of part-time work, two, three days a week for the time being, we're gonna continue, continue helping. Othon has been very mm -hmm. adamant on getting that to the families and I've helped let them understand that it's not that you won't get qualified anymore. We want, on, al contrario, on the contrary, use that new income to buy what used to be a novelty is now a luxury, ice cream, fucking ice cream. Go buy your kids ice cream with that money. Go pay your rent, get out of debt, chip away at that big block because there's no other way to do it right now. The last thing we want you as a person of this program to worry about food. Right, right. Uh, well, Guys, uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to wrap it up here soon. But Othon, you you and Damian are at the at the uh, at the office right now. Um, Othon, do you can you show us like around a little bit? I mean, do you, do you already have a, sure. a pickup today I've or? Get, yeah, you... I've been getting up because uh, uh, Edwin, who works with us, has been uh, unloading. So I'm gonna tell you about this program. Uh, he's been loading a truck with a truck driver. Um, we're very fortunate um, to be able to feed a family of four for $33. Um, and we've also been able to expand our program and add in, you know, close to, like you said, 600 families. And we're trying to get to like 800 um, as quickly as possible because we know there's people that are in need of food security. So I want to, I want to thank very much uh, this company called Best of Food Service. Um, they, in conjunction with their charitable arm, uh, Chefs and Hunger, uh, Mrs. Brett Waters uh, is an amazing, amazing person. She has helped us so much and helped me especially like learn how to navigate the broken food system. Um, we are one of several recipients in Los Angeles uh, of this USDA grant program. USDA finally figured out that dairy farmers were dumping milk down the drain and, you know, uh, farmers were tilling, tilling into the soil lettuce because they couldn't afford it anyway to pick it and transportation companies weren't gonna transport food for free. So the USDA took them a while, but they, they stepped up and they have have really uh, changed the game because it's been able to employ a lot of people throughout the food transportation system. So um, we get, uh, do this guy. So right behind me is some of the boxes that are coming in. There is a driver, Luis, and then Edwin bringing in boxes for everyone. So, you know, it's uh, we, it's hard. We don't have an actual dock. You know, the truck can't just back up and unload pallets. Pallets don't even fit through our doors, so we have to actually have them, uh, you know, broken broken down. But this is some of the food, you know, um, apples, citrus, 
And then for that, we're gonna we're gonna add rice and beans. And what was no. this space before? What was this like a, a bar? Or what was this space before it became a storage room like right? this? Um, it's our office creative space. So we, we do have a full bar and that bar was built so we could have clients over and basically get them uh, set up on all the drinks we would make for them for the program. Because oftentimes when you build a bar chef, I mean, a restaurant chef, you know that uh, construction always takes longer than expected and the bar is the last thing they build. So now we're just packaging up food. So yeah, from this beautiful food kit that we get as a basic uh, item, we'll add the rice and the beans and the meats and everything else that we get for the kids. A lot of snacks for the kids uh, through one of our good friends who has a, a school breakfast program. She gives Jackie, us, oh yeah, Jackie. Jackie. Those are all little, you know, cookies and, and fruit boxes and crayons and coloring materials. It's awesome. Just to give the kids a sense of normality, you know? It's just these are items that they used to receive in elementary school or pre-K or whatever. And then they see this little grape juice box and the goldfish and uh, you should see their eyes light up. The look in their eyes makes us work even harder. Yeah. Just, you know, they're the future, el futuro. Absolutely. I'll take you guys outside. You can see the truck actually right here in front of our office. You know, it's no joke. It's so we're moving about 80,000 pounds of food a week through our office. And it's, it's a lot wow. of food, 80,000 pounds that we have to like Holy pick up, cow. move, pick up again, move and load out. But it's great, you know? Pero queríamos norte. That's right. Here's milk. Juan and Norte. <laughs> hundreds of gallons of milk that we're going to put in our fridges right now. Uh, and all this food will go out tomorrow. We'll, uh, we'll get it all out to the families tomorrow. Well, guys, um, I, I, I want to kind of end on a hopefully on a hopeful note here and uh, um, ask all of you, whoever would like to chime in here, how, where do we go from here? How do we, how do we improve our food systems in terms of minimizing exploited labor with our, you know, fellow migrant workers? Um, as Stephanie has also said, we're bound by capitalistic rules in this country that exploited migrant labor goes back generations. That is the most American thing you could think of. It's like ingrained in our American society and our capitalism, um, whether you like it or not, you know? It's just part of our, 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 our system here. So how can we, how can we start to rethink how we could improve um, the conditions for these workers or at least look for better ways to change the system, especially now that the people are rising up for social justice and we're seeing things change. But we're also talking to um, an audience here of people that are a part of the food industry. Um, so I kind of ask this question to all of you from your perspective, how can we as a food industry do better? How can we look to rebuild a better future for uh, our migrant workers and for our undocumented workers um, and hopefully start to change some of the stigma uh, around this labor force? Claudia, why don't you, do you wanna, do you wanna chime in first? Yeah, I think it, it really, and this is also go back to when I opened my restaurant and I thought about what am I going to charge people for our food, right? And in a, in a society where people only want to pay $2 for a taco that takes sometimes three days to make, right? The nixtamalization of corn, no one understands how long that process is and how much labor goes into it. So factoring in people's hours that it took, paying people livable wages. I didn't want my cooks working three jobs. So I thought to make sure that I charged a reasonable amount for what the product they put, people were receiving. We were growing our own vegetables on the property. It doesn't happen, doesn't happen for free. Um, I was paying livable wages. So really I think what this industry, instead of being afraid of what the consumer won't pay, it's if we all rise up at the same time and say, you know what, here's our worth. And this is what it's going to take for us to not live in impoverished conditions. No one talks about food scarcity in the United States and food insecurities among a giant part of our population. Like you think of San Diego, you think of LA, 
all Bakersfield, Fresno, the entire state of California, just in California, is we have serious food insecurities. And I know people, I know chefs from like the French Laundry that are DACA recipients, and they are terrified of being sent back to a country they don't know, but they're also very insecure about being proud to be Mexican because of the backlash that American society has towards us. But in reality, if we all rise up at the same time, and that goes for every, I'm not just saying ethnic, I hate saying ethnic restaurants, but every restaurant, if we all come up and say, you know what, this is what this is worth because of where we buy the vegetables. And then in turn, the farmer can then not pay their workers unlivable wages, right? Like if they charge more for the lettuce, I hope they charge more for lettuce because that employee hopefully then gets a livable wage and then it just trickle down effect, right? Like it, it, it's just a matter of numbers. And if everyone just sucks it up and I mean, we're making six figures. A lot of the people in, you know, all these tech communities that we support in San Diego, Southern California, LA, San Francisco, people are making money to pay for what the vegetables should cost. I don't want to be paid 99 cents for a lettuce. It kills me to pay 99 cents for a lettuce because I know that person that picked it got five cents per fucking head of lettuce. And that pisses me off. Right. And it's like, if, if I want, I want to pay $2 for a lettuce, I want to pay $3 for a lettuce, whatever it is, I want to pay a, what it's worth. And that is worth is it is way past the lettuce. That worth is a human life that picks it. And until robots run our agricultural economy, I'm sorry, I'd rather pay of what it's worth because I know that I'm sustaining a life apart from that lettuce. It's not about the ingredients. It's about the people that do the fucking work. Amen. Stephanie, what's the final word? Tell us. Yeah, I think as a researcher, as a professor, um, I attempt to be a public sociologist, right? Do this work that takes academia to the community. Um, I think storytelling from every perspective is the, the, the game changer, right? And I mean, we're of the same generation here. We know about the rise of dreamers, the rise of DACA and the, that, the power of sharing narratives. And I think um, what No Us Without You is, is doing is bringing attention, we're, we're at a peak crisis, right? But the plight of undocumented workers in the US, that has been, it's been consistent that more people are experiencing it now than before, the crowded conditions, the lack of healthcare, the lack of employment, uh, food impoverishment, all of those things. Yeah, it's more than um, even last year, but it, it's ongoing. So even when the pandemic is over and we have a vaccine and everything goes back to normal, whatever that looks like, uh, these stories need to be told because whether it's 150,000 or 1.5 million, there's still human lives that are suffering in these conditions, losing their cars, losing access to the internet, so on and so forth, right? I think telling the stories of immigrants, um, the unheard voices really representing them. And, and we're seeing now the conversation around people in positions of privilege really need to step up and mind the gap for the people that can't speak up for themselves. And I appreciate what um, they're doing uh, with this program, this food program, because it, yeah, you, you could have signed your up for unemployment and checked out and been good with your extra 600, right? But you really uh, stepped up to, to mind the gap. And I think more of us need to do that. And I think also, um, people like the farm owners, right? The restaurant owners telling the stories of like, yeah, I put ads out every month for, for the need for work, right? Antonio, you and I talked a few weeks ago about this uh, New York farm, farm owner who needed 200 hands, like 200 employees on his farm. He got 12 people, US born people to apply for the job. Nine people quit before the end of the first day. The other three didn't show up for the second day. Like people are not willing to do that work. So changing the narrative about this deviant uh, job stealing immigrant, right? Like Damien keeps saying, this is the backbone of our food industry from the food picking to the food serving, right? And everything in between. And I think um, people in positions of privilege need to step up and say, yeah, I keep putting ads out, people aren't applying, right? We need to tell more stories about where the, the immigrants um, tax contributions go, state taxes, local taxes, sales taxes, home ownership taxes, 
uh, income taxes that are taken, whether or not their social security number is theirs or fake or whatever. The Social Security Administration doesn't have any problem withdrawing taxes from immigrants' paychecks, right? I know uh, factory owners who do taxes off of undocumented immigrants' work, but they're really keeping $300 for themselves telling the immigrant that it's taxes, right? Like immigrants are willing to pay taxes. They're willing to contribute to our state and federal economies and do so because they feel like they're a part of whatever system that we're, we're saying, you know, promising will take care of them. And even when we see state level stimulus packages like the California or New York incentives for undocumented immigrants, that money that they're being given is their money, right? At the state level, immigrants contribute $12 billion of taxes every year. At the federal level, I had to write it down, $20 billion of taxes every year. Uh, so there's nothing withholding us from giving that money back to those people, right? But we want to continue this narrative. And I think that, that they're job stealers or that they're harming us or um, draining our economy when really they're the greatest contributors to our, our livelihood and everyday life, right? Uh, so I think the storytelling and calling people out on um, telling those stories when they have them uh, is really important to changing the way that we work and, and holding policymakers accountable to protecting immigrant workers. Absolutely. Um, guys, thank you so, so, so much uh, for, for uh, sharing your wisdom, for your insight, and for your experiences. Um, and for cussing. <laughs> you for having us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's so, I mean, we could keep on talking for, for a very long time, um, but we're going to wrap it up here. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I just saw uh, Damien, I just saw a quick question here on 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 the chat that uh if you guys need any volunteers um i'll, I'll add us please um if anyone watching is intrigued or wants to jump at the chance at volunteer uh, let's get in communication you can follow us on instagram at know us without you uh all one word uh, i challenge anyone that is watching this that is part of the hospitality industry to the next time that you go in for that shift to go talk to the dishwasher to go have a conversation with the compadre or the comadre in the back of the house and get to know them a little bit more. Uh, if you already do that, fuck yeah, about that life, I love it. Um, send them over to us if they need food assistance, please. Even if they're working one or two days, um, again, DM us on Instagram or you can go online, uh, know us without you, LA, uh, on our website and then we can get, get you more information. Um, I'm giving out my direct phone number to each and every one of these families to make sure that they're part of our program, but we're also making sure that these individuals are the most in need. So if you have any inquiries, whether it be volunteer or how do I get a family that I know, I am a family, holler at us please on Instagram or our website, please. Thank you. Absolutely, and, and, and if you can't volunteer but you still wanna support these guys, it's 33 bucks, that goes a long way. That's That That's supports. Tag that, someone, tag your millionaire friend. Just yeah. <laughs> Put um, us on your Instagram stories. Just share our cause, the message of our cause. We yeah. want people to just hear this shit, whether you're in Miami, New York, Chicago, everywhere, USA, man. Just and 30, 30 bucks, cause, man. Please. 30 bucks pays. $33 is all you need. That you pays for a week for for a family for of four. 33 right. bucks, that's like that's like two coffees at Blue Bottle. So come on, like let's just skip the coffee for, <laughs> for a second. That's a couple of shots of your favorite tequila, man. There you like, go. Well... <laughs> Uh, I want to thank everybody that tuned in today, this morning, um, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. We're going to have many more conversations like this uh, uh, on Life and Time. We're going to continue these webinars and these important discussions. They're uh, completely free. This is free education. We want um, this is a public good, and, and we want this information to get out to as many people as possible. But at the same time, uh, Life and Time is funded completely through um membership so you know after you did you you, you donate your 33 dollars to know us without you maybe you know, what's another five bucks and, <laughs> and give it to life in time for a membership you know it's, it's it's no big deal come on i mean you're already in a giving manner um but no seriously we, we rely heavily on our members to to support our, our editorial and, and our work like this um thank you again to our, our amazing panelists damian Oton, claudette and stephanie uh, such a pleasure and stay safe out there and good luck. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you.